Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom event. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know that we have been celebrating big cats. So uh, the last three Decembers, we've dedicated the month to hosting scientists, explorers who have dedicated their lives to studying, to capturing media for us to see, as well as uh, rehabilitating, rescuing, conserving important land uh, needed for big cat survival. So we've been talking to big cat scientists from South America, from North America, from Asia and Africa. It's been a ton of fun this month and I can't believe things are winding up uh, so quickly with the holidays approaching. So I wanna give a quick shout out to the classrooms I see who are starting to tune in live on YouTube. Don't forget you can get in on the action. On the right, there's a chat sidebar. Uh, let us know where you're watching from, send in some questions and we'll work some of those in. And of course, to any classroom joining us, take some pictures, uh, post them to Twitter, hashtag explore classroom and tag at Nat Geo Education. We love to see classrooms in action. All right, so let's change gears and get to the main event. We've got Mark Elbrock joining us today. He is a scientist, tracker, writer, and storyteller. Our position is lead scientist for the Puma program at Panthera, which is a global nonprofit uh, focused on wildcat conservation. So Mark's research on mountain lions is contributing uh, radical changes to what we know about the species, especially about their social life and their role as keystone uh, predators. So his work was central in storylines of the BBC film, Big Cats in High Places, as well as Nat Geo's Wild Cougar Undercover. So Mark, it's so awesome to have you joining us live today. We've got a great group of classrooms from across North America. Looking forward to get to know you a little better. And then they're gonna fire some questions at you. All right. Are you ready? All right, <laughs> we're ready. Okay, so I'll just dive in with a, a short presentation first. Is that that's the plan? Perfect. Let's do it. All right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a presentation here, and um, we'll just begin with that, and then we'll open it up to to questions, etc. But um, can someone just let me know that you can see this presentation? Yeah, it looks good, Mark. All right. Well, let's go right into it. Um, Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. It's, it's great to be able to share what I do every day. I, I, I forget about the rest of the world out there. I, I work mostly alone um, or with a very small group of people in the woods and, uh, and hardly ever make it to town. So hello, everybody out there in the world. And um, thanks for joining us this morning. I, I work with mountain lions. This is a mountain lion um, in America, Leone you know, is a common one, puma in the far south of Patagonia. But um, all of them are the same lots when they're born. That's when they're a bit bigger. The, the two kittens are on the left. And mountain lions, just like all the other big cats, they're, they're really just like house cats, just much larger. And the one big difference, of course, that they can kill animals that weigh about eight times as much as them. So really big animals. And mountain lions, you know, are much like other big cats in that they're all kind of stocky and strong, really muscular animals. And they have short legs in comparison to their bodies. But mountain lions in particular have really big back ends. I can make my little pointer. This, their back end is just much bigger than their front end. And that gives them the ability to jump incredible distances up and to the side and to be able to leap up onto the back of animals that are so much larger than them. And they have these huge thick tails, really mountain lions and snow leopards are the two with the biggest, thickest, heaviest tails that they can use to throw side to side so that when they're chasing animals in cliffy areas or other dangerous areas, they can maintain their balance. And the big thing about big cats is that they have really small lungs and hearts. So they can run really, really fast for very, very short distances. And so if the animal gets away, well, that's too bad. And the thing about mountain lions and you know big cats in general is that they are equipped to kill animals quickly. That's what they do. That's how they survive. They bite and take down large animals and they eat them. And but that's what really mountain lions are. They're, they are animals adapted to be able to get in close to an animal, almost invisible, and then to leap up and to take that animal down. And because of that, they're really scary. They have big teeth, they have claws, 
they're kind of an invisible animal. So people get scared when they can't see something. You know this, like walking in the dark, you start, your mind starts to worry. And because of this, people are so afraid of them that they've been killing them for centuries now. We kill mountain lions all the time. And in some parts of the world, mountain lions, there's very few left because people are so afraid of them. So much of my work is really about how do I get people like you to fall in love with mountain lions, even when they can be a little bit scary. And so these are the things that I really do as a scientist. I, quite honestly, I try to get people to fall in love with them by reaching out to their hearts, being like, look at these amazing, cute, beautiful animals. You should fall in love with them. I teach people about them, all the great things that they do for us in our natural systems. Um, I study them. I learn about their secret lives. I learn what the threats are, like what's actually, what are the problems for mountain lions? What are they trying to deal with in the real world, world to survive? And then I try to reduce the, you know, the negative interactions between people and mountain lions, meaning I don't want mountain lions to kill pets or goats or sheep. I certainly don't want mountain lions and people to, you know, come into contact where there might be a mountain lion that jumps on a person or something like that. And then, you know, we want to kind of help people understand why it's beneficial to them to keep mountain lions around. And, and, you know, because mountain lions sort of live an invisible life around us, people don't really get to see them. So just being able to see youngsters playing and they, they really are just big cats that spend almost all of their time, these kittens are now, I'm trying to remember, maybe 13 months old, and they still, their whole life is about playing, jumping, springing, and spending time together. And then here's some of the, you know, recent research we've been working on that kind of revealed that these are two adults that are both female and they're both mothers right now. So at this time, at this site, there were nine mountain lions with all the young mountain lions that were you know, born of these two females plus the two females. And what that was right there is a little exchange and then they spent a day and a half feeding together at a really big elk that was killed by this mountain lion right here. And it was just an amazing opportunity to see these mountain lions, that was it. There was no big fight, there was no claws, there was no blood. They just are all eating together. And that kind of flies in the face of what we thought we knew about them. And so here's an example of education. So most of you have probably heard of McDonald's. It's this chain restaurant that's all around the world now. And what do mountain lions and, and McDonald's have in common? So this is probably a little bit before your time, but this was the old commercial for mountain lions. And it was all about this idea that they have served so many people around the world, more people than any other restaurant in the world. That over 99 billion people have been, have eaten a, a hamburger or chicken McNuggets or something at McDonald's. And in the United States alone, they serve 1 billion pounds of red cow meat to Americans, which are, that, that number is so big, it's probably hard to even comprehend. I don't really know. Like I can't envision what 1 billion pounds of meat looks like, but it's a lot. And so what does that have to do with mountain lions? Well, it ends up that mountain lions feed the world too. They provide across North and South America over a billion pounds of meat to their communities. That means they give food away to birds and other animals that can come and feed at their kill sites. And they actually give away more food every year than McDonald's does in the United States. That's a lot of food. So if you could picture 3.3 million pounds of hamburgers every day, mountain lions are giving to the community. That's pretty amazing. And this is kind of what happens. I mean, it, it doesn't look as nice as a McDonald's restaurant, but this is a golden eagle, a coyote, and black-billed magpies all fighting over who gets the free food. And so we studied this and we found all sorts of animals are eating. Mice, squirrels, tons of kinds of birds, bears, vultures, eagles, all sorts of animals are benefiting from the food provided by mountain lions. In Wyoming, where this study was done, 39 different kinds of birds and mammals ate 
from the kills of mountain lions. They just eat, they're just giving food away. And all of that food, it, it's kind of interesting. The more animals that eat from mountain lion kills, the stronger the system is because that allows these linkages and food webs to build up and energy can move around and it helps ecosystems get stronger and it, they're able to heal themselves if they're ever hurt. So that's the same thing that between mountain lions and McDonald's, they both give away millions of pounds of food every day, giving it away to their communities. What's the difference between McDonald's and mountain lions? Well, this picture is of the Amazon rainforest, which has been burning these last month. And the difference is that when you buy at McDonald's, you support the burning of rainforests because McDonald's is one of the retailers that buys their beef from the Amazon system. So McDonald's gives away food to the masses, but they also destroy forests. Mountain lions give away food to the masses and make forests stronger. That's a little graphic. It's one of the things I work with other people and we make these information graphics to help teach people about the positive things that mountain lions do. Um, for teachers, this is available for free for anyone to use. You can get it through Panthera or this company at the bottom right here, Wild Futures. They can be contacted for a copy as well. And just moving on, a, an example of threats. So unfortunately, sometimes mountain lions eat sheep. That's not actually a sheep eaten by a mountain lion, but it's a dead sheep. And so they get killed for that. And so we've been testing all these various ways. These are called fox lights, these things, and they, they make these strobing colored lights and it keeps mountain lions away from sheep, makes people happy. You can put them in pens. So I, we teach communities how to protect their sheep and other animals. And here's a big fence thing with a roof because mountain lions can jump so high, you want a roof. And so that's in the way of looking at that. This is research we're doing on the Olympic Peninsula. I'm just running through a couple of examples. This big red arrow, right now this highway, this yellow line right here, mountain lions are having a really hard time crossing this highway. And so we're working with the Department of Transportation in Washington State and many other people to figure out how and where to build places where they can cross on a big bridge or go underneath if we put a big sort of a big tunnel underneath the highways. And we're doing this with six tribal nations out on the peninsula where we're all working together to catch mountain lions, follow them around, figure out how they can cross this highway. And that's our team that works in the Olympics. And last thing I'm gonna show you, this is my work down in Patagonia. And it's this huge open landscape and you can see mountain lions, it's amazing. You just walk around and they're out there and people are now going there, here's two people, and taking pictures, do you see the mountain lions right there? Of mountain lions in the wild, it's crazy. This is the kind of photo you can get down there in Patagonia, of wild mountain lions. And the problem now is that people are getting so close to mountain lions that everybody's afraid there's gonna be an attack. And so there's no safety guidelines. So one of the things I'm working with folks down there on is how do we allow people to do this, but still stay safe. And what's safe for mountain lions as well, because we don't wanna be with them every day, which means that they might have less opportunity to hunt and that can impact their youngsters, etc. So that's just a, a run through crazy blitz of different things that I work on and why I work on them and some pictures of mountain lions, of course. So there you go. All right, Mark, that was awesome. Thanks so much for sharing the presentation, sharing the work that you're doing. And I love that McDonald's analogy. It's a really good way to, to break it down and make sense uh, of the importance that uh, they do play uh, in ecosystems, really cool. So Mark, what I'll get you to do at the top of your screen, there should be an option to stop the screen share and that'll bring you back to us and then we'll start meeting some of our classrooms. Perfect, we got gotcha. you, all right. Uh, shout out to some YouTube classrooms who are tuning in already and introducing themselves. We've got Mr. Needles class in Smithtown, New York. We've got Miss Hines Maker Lab in Brooklyn, New York joining us. 
let's see. We've got another group hanging out with us in North Carolina. Okay, very cool. So we have classrooms hanging out from uh, all over the place with us. Let's jump into a live class now. Let's see. Let's go to Montana to start. We've got some students hanging out in Kalispell uh, with Mrs. Sinclair. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Montana? Hi, my name is Elon. Um, how big is a baby mountain lion? How old do you want to know? Like when they're born, maybe, or how? Um, when they're born. When they're born, they're about this big. When they're born, and then by the time they're four weeks old, they weigh about four pounds. And then from week three to week 10, they gain about a pound per week. So if it's a five week old, you expect it to be around five pounds. Wow. All right, good question. And I bet Montana has some mountain lions around. Yep. Oh yeah. All right, <laughs> let's see, where should we go now? Let's go to um glenview illinois miss michael has some grade fours hanging out with her let's get that microphone turned on how are we doing grade fours everybody how you doing Good. yeah i've got two short questions let's see if lauren will come up first if that would be okay lauren go ahead how many years have you been studying mountain lions and what do you study i have been studying mountain lions next month marks my 20th anniversary so it'll be 20 years. <laughs> and Eve. Thank you, Lauren. Do the males fight over the females? And if so, what happens? It's a very good question. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But um, yes, uh, big territorial males can fight occasionally over access to females in territories. And what happens is usually a lot of snarling and craziness and fur flying, just like in that video of the Wanako. There can be blood, there can be, sometimes it's rare, but occasionally one will kill the other one. Usually one just beats the other one up and the other one limps away and, uh, and escapes. But on occasion, they, they literally kill each other. All right, good questions. I'm gonna visit YouTube and grab a question from our YouTube groups. I wanna give another shout out to uh, Ms. Kularis's second graders hanging out in Arlington, Virginia. And then from YouTube, let's take, let's see. All right, we've got a question uh, about the cubs that uh, they can have. How many cubs can they have at once? What's the maximum? You can see anywhere from one to five. And the average where I've worked, pretty much everywhere I've worked, has been three. Okay. Like down in Patagonia, for instance, I don't know if you, we had that picture from Patagonia, had four. And it's not uncommon to see four cubs. All right. A testament to how good a hunters they are, being able to raise three to five cubs. is pretty impressive. Well, they don't always raise them all to dispersal. That's the challenge is you can have, you can give birth to four cubs, but to make four cubs survive 18 months until they survive on their own, that's a real challenge. And often they'll lose one or two along the way. All right. Let's take a trip to Boulder, Colorado. Third and fourth graders hang out with Miss Arakovsky. So let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Colorado? Climate change is affecting the population of mountain lions and their prey? That's a great question. And it's uh, without doubt, climate change is impacting mountain lions and their prey. Uh, mountain lions are lucky compared to some animals in that they're very, very adaptable. So much of the, the things they have to deal with are really just how their prey is, is in different places, how the trees are changing, which are changing the distribution of the elk and the deer, and they follow the elk and the deer. 
So it is making their lives harder. We know that as temperatures warm, a lot of animals are giving birth earlier. We're also seeing them shift when they give birth. They're giving birth later in the summer. And that means that the kittens are really small when they go into winter, which in your home, Boulder, up through Montana, up to Kalispell, when the kittens are born that late, their, their ears are really thin, and so they often get frostbite. And so they lose the tips of their ears, they lose the tips of their, their tails, and we've seen a, an, an up spike in that, at least in Wyoming, where I've been working for the last, in the last sort of six, seven years. All right, good question. So we have uh, Ms. Wafer joining us, and she is from Laurel Springs School. It's an online group of students spread all over the place. Let me turn her microphone on because I bet she's got a few questions for us. So we're ready for you. Hey, Miss Wafer. Hi. Well, thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions. First, uh, Claire in New York in sixth grade wanted to say, already in love with mountain lions. Thank you for that. But she really already loves mountain lions. Um, and so um, Alessandro's in eighth grade in China and wondering why do the mindsets of domestic cats and the mountain lions seem alike. And then just one other quick question from Larissa, also in eighth grade in Florida, about where the uh, mountain lion population most lives in the world. Okay, good question. Why are house cats and mountain lions similar in mindset? Whew, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I probably have no idea. Um, I, don't, I don't know enough about how they think to be able to answer that well. Um, I think that much of the way they think has been influenced by how they survive in the world. So if you think of how a, a domestic cat would hunt and survive without the help of us. So if there's no cat food, there's no warm house at the end of the day, what are they gonna do? They spend their time sneaking around, trying to be quiet, listening, watching. If you've ever watched one stock up on a bird feeder or something like that, it's exactly how a mountain lion hunts and moves in the world. And because they move the same, they hunt the same, no doubt much of their thinking is similar. But um, beyond that, I can't know because I don't really know what they think. I would love to know what a mountain lion thinks. I really would. But I, I wish, I, I honestly don't know what a mountain lion thinks. Um, as far as where are the most mountain lions, is that kind of your question? Where are the most in the world? Um, that's a good question because between the US border with Mexico, all the way down essentially to South America, the tip of South America, we don't really know where mountain lions are or how many there are. We are just finishing up a project in Torres del Paine National Park in Southern Patagonia in Chile. And I think it's going to be the highest density, meaning the most mountain lions that live in one small place ever recorded. Um, we've gathered half the data and it's looking like, wow, this is gonna be the highest density of mountain lions ever found anywhere in the world. So there you go. All right, very cool. And sounds like there's still lots of work to be done uh, okay. for many countries. All right, uh, Goddard, Ontario. Uh, Mrs. Ball has some students hanging out with her. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Goddard? How are we doing, everyone? <laughs> We're good, Joe. Um, we um, have a bit of controversy here about whether cougars have been released in Ontario to control the deer population. Does Mark know anything about that? Um. I honestly don't know, but I can I can speak to the idea because it's a common one throughout the East, um, meaning like uh, in the United States, you hear it in Maine and through New England and down through New York and into even the Eastern Seaboard south, south of there. You hear it in um, Newfoundland and up in Quebec and in Ontario. There's been a lot of controversy I know about um, whether they are naturalized mountain lions that have been um, detected there or whether they were brought there and released. And, you know, the truth is, I, I think that the evidence says that it's all of these things. There have been people who have um, released pets in the northeast of the United States and in eastern Canada. 
um, but you're also seeing more natural dispersal from Western populations moving eastward. And that is happening more and more often. Um, just in the last 10 years, there has been almost a four time increase than the 10 years previous to that in mountain lions being discovered in say the Midwestern United States, um, for, in, for example. And in Ontario, they, they know that they've had cats through there and that they are in fact wild mountain lions moving into Ontario. Um, the idea of your question specifically was, are people going, catching wild mountain lions, driving them in some black armored van, um, black ops, maybe a helicopter, government funded, let's say, maybe it's the secret government agency that's doing this, and releasing mountain lions to control the deer. I, I can tell you that in my 20 years, um, there's been no evidence that that's happening. There's, there's no secret conspiracy. There's no, uh, as far as I know, secret organiza organization trying to bring mountain lions back um, to Ontario or anywhere east of there or south of there. Um, they're, they're actually getting there on their own, which is amazing and exciting and scary for folks who haven't lived with mountain lions for 150 years, 100 years. Um, your, your lives are about to change as mountain lions recolonize the east and begin to establish breeding populations. All right, let's see. Let's go to YouTube and grab another question from the YouTube community. So this question that just came in is about um, how someone could go about becoming a big cat scientist like you. What's one path maybe that someone could take? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, I am a terrible role model. Um, my path was more creative than most, perhaps. Um, I got into, sort of my path was this. So fascinated with nature, born that way forever. It's all I wanted to do was study animals or be with animals. Um, sort of got distracted, got more into sort of footprints and following animals and teaching people about tracking and things like that. But then I started working for scientists to find and catch animals for them. And then I said, gosh, I've got my own questions. I wonder if I could be a scientist plus the person who catches the animal. And that's sort of how I got into it. So I started, I went to school late when I was older and, and became a, you know, a quote scientist um, a bit later in life so that I could have my own questions and design my own research um, and just follow whatever my heart wanted to to do. But the traditional path, that is the, probably the easier one, is um, you go to school. You know, in truth, you, you go to college, you get good grades. Um, what you study in your first level of college doesn't matter so much, but you got to get good grades so that you get into graduate school where you would study something to do with wildlife, ecology or wildlife conservation or whatever it is. And then you write to all the people you know, contact scientists and say, please, can I come join your project and help out for a while? And they say yes. And then boom, bada bing, suddenly you are a scientist. All right. Well, that hits home a point that we often get here on Explore Classroom is that there really isn't a right or a wrong way to get into science and that there's many different paths. So there's some people who know what they want to do, laser focused all the way. There's others who it takes a little bit of time trying a few different things before they find their passion. And it sounds like uh, you fit the bill of someone who found your passion and went after what you wanted. For sure. And I would definitely, you know, to just add one thing is that anyone can be a scientist and anyone can ask good questions. You don't actually need to be, to go to college to be a scientist. That's, uh, you don't need to go to graduate school to ask questions about animals and to find answers. You can start doing it in your own backyard. And, and certainly I did that for years before I officially went to school and you know, got the little letters after my name, so. All right, absolutely. We're gonna jump to some fifth graders now in Calgary, Mrs. Pearson's class. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Alberta? Good. How are you guys? Do mountain lions have predators? That's a good question. 
That is a, an actually a fantastic question because it's one near and dear to my heart. And it's something I've been studying a lot is the fact that mountain lions, they are a top predator. Some people call them an apex predator. Or you hear these different words, but they're not the top, top predator. They're in fact below jaguars, brown bears or grizzly bears, black bears, and especially wolves. And so in places where they live with other predators, they have to change how they live. They have to hide. They have to hide their food so it doesn't get stolen. They have to hide their kittens so they don't get killed. And so it's actually quite difficult to be a mountain lion you know, in the West, especially where many of these predators still live. And so these things impact the lives of mountain lions and the, what they do with their lives every day, where they live, how they hunt, where they keep their kittens, where they hide their food. I mean, every part of their life is weighing sort of in their brain. Imagine like you leave your house in the morning and you're like, my goodness, I could be killed at any moment or my kittens could be killed at any moment. What am I going to do? You do? You make different decisions than if you walk outside your house and you say, I'm the biggest, baddest thing out here. No one's messing with me. And so that is the life of a mountain lion. And we've been really studying that the last few years and helping people understand why mountain lions are the way they are. One of the reasons is that they are not the top of the food chain. All right. Uh, where are we going now? Virginia, eighth graders hanging out with um, Miss Weeks. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, eighth graders? I, I hear them. All right. <laughs> oh, that's better. That's louder. Hi, everybody. We have three questions today, and we're going to allow the students to ask those. Our first student is Stephen. Hi. Um, Hello. What animals do mountain lions eat? And if they were be, uh, to become extinct, what would happen to the other animal populations that they eat? Uh, good questions, complex questions, Stephen. Um, so, uh, so let's think. To what do they eat? Mountain lions are um, intelligent, curious, and adaptable. And that is just another way of saying they'll eat just about anything they can catch. So up to the size of generally an elk, if you, uh, if you live in a place with elk, they occasionally take adult cows and adult horses, but that's rare, or at least across most of their range. But when they're youngsters, they'll eat, you know, anything. Beavers, squirrels, marmots, woodchucks, you know, anything they can catch. And as they get more proficient in hunting, because it takes years to become a good hunter, they start getting bigger and bigger prey like deer and then working their way up to eating mostly elk. And even when they eat deer and elk as adults, they tend to eat the youngsters rather than the old experienced ones that kick them and hit them with antlers and can actually wound them quite badly. What happens when they go extinct? Well, that's pretty easy to know because you just have to look at the east coast of the United States and Canada where deer populations are crazy out of control. And that's not just because mountain lions are extinct. It's, uh, you know, all predators are extinct out there. Wolves have a much larger impact on prey populations than, than mountain lions, but mountain lions can dampen at least deer populations. They can't really control them when they're that out of control, that big. Um, but what you see is that, yeah, deer are out of control, recruitment in the forest is down, so little baby trees can't grow, everything changes. All right, let me turn your mic on because I know you guys have another one. There we go. This is Maddox. Hi, I was wondering what your favorite big cat to track was and why. My favorite big cat to track. I have not tracked all the big cats. Um, I've worked in Africa some, so I've worked with lions and leopards, and I've worked with mountain lions. I've never seen a wild jaguar, at least not yet. I almost saw one last year. Uh, on a capture expedition and then the veterinarian was attacked by killer bees and had to be medevaced out and the expedition was called off. Um, so I can't tell you if I have a favor. I've never seen snow leopards. I've never seen a tiger, you know, except in zoos. Um, but I certainly have dedicated my lives to mountain lions and um, I, there's still so much to learn about mountain lions. I can't imagine 
ever growing bored and wanting to change. So there's just, we're just getting going with mountain lions. We're just really starting to learn about them, in my opinion, you know, their secret, secret lives. And so for folks like you who are coming up with this brand new technology, what we can study today and how we can track them more closely and see them in the wild, I mean, the sky's the limit. So I'm probably going to stay where I am. All right. So let's uh, visit a couple more classrooms to work in some questions. So give me a big hands up if you guys have a burning question in your classroom. We'll try to work through a couple more. All right. Let's start in Montana. Your microphone is on. My name is Hunter, and how do you get so close to the mountain lions while taking pictures? That's a good question. So in the U.S., the, the most common way is you use hounds. So these are dogs that are trained by people with a great passion for teaching and training dogs um, to follow the scent, the smell, of mountain lions. So you find fresh footprints and then the dogs follow the trail and they chase the cat usually into a place where it feels safe, like a tree or a cave or some place like that. And then you can go right up to them. Um, one of the things that's interesting about mountain lions in compared to other big cats is that they are very, very timid. So you can go very, very close and not, not ever be worried about yourself. Um, in Patagonia, you can get that close without any dogs. You can just walk and some of them will let you get as close as you are to other people in your class right now um, without any worry. Others won't let you get that close, but some will. And so, yeah, I mean, in the wild, when you see a mountain lion, if they can see you, interestingly enough, that when you see a mountain lion and you want to get close, you don't try to hide. You can't hide from a mountain lion. That's uh, it's almost impossible. So you just, you let them see you and you can walk quite close then because they can kind of assess how comfortable they are. If they're not comfortable, they'll leave. If they're comfortable, they'll let you get close. So that's kind of the strategy with mountain lions. And as I said, these are, you know, different than say leopards. You know, I've worked, I've caught leopards and whew, they are not timid. They're very aggressive. Um, but with mountain lions, I feel very, very safe going quite close. Okay, uh, we're gonna go to Colorado now. Let's see if I can get that microphone turned on. There we go. Um, how much does a mature mountain lion need to eat and how big is its territory? So you're Again. You want to say your name? How much <laughs> does a mature mountain lion need to eat and how big is its territory? I got it. How much does it need to eat? It's a, it's a loaded question. They only need to eat, you know, a couple of pounds of meat per day. But they tend to eat a lot more than that. So they tend to eat about three times as much as they need. So they tend in the summer, for instance, to kill an animal about every five, six days, but they're usually smaller animals. And in the winter, when they eat larger animals, they tend to kill one about every seven to eight days. Now they don't eat all of those animals. A lot of it goes to the community. They give it away, just like McDonald's. They give it away, except they don't charge money. And the reason is sometimes they give it away because they're full. Sometimes in the winter, it freezes into the ice and they can't get it all. In the summer, the insects come in and the maggots and the other insects and they eat so much of it, they can't eat it all. Or a bear steals it or some wolves steal it. So they're, you know, the food doesn't all get eaten. So how much they eat versus how much they kill are different. Um, and then as far as their territories, it, it varies kind of where they live, but in general, a female has a home range of about 50 square miles and a, and a male would be about 200 square miles. So they're pretty big. They like to wander. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Ms. Pearson's class, do you guys have one more question for us?
No, I don't hear them. Maybe they had to uh, go for a recess break. All right, hmm. let's check in. I can see Miss Wafer. Do you have one more from your community for us? I do, thank you. And like I said, our kids are all over the world. I'm in a virtual classroom with over 50 of them and they're asking questions. So Celine um, is wondering, she's in Mexico, um, are, have you ever had any dangers in your work? Is your work dangerous? And then Nicole and Natalie are asking about what to do if they did encounter a mountain lion. Good questions. Have I ever had dangers in my work? Um, yes, definitely. Most of the dangers in my work are to do with the landscape, meaning like steep cliffs and it's icy and I've slid and almost gone over, um, falling out of trees when I'm climbing trees with cats in them. Um, those are the things that I get most worried about, especially as I get older and my body is a little less resilient than it used to be. Um, when I was 20, I sort of bounced when I hit the ground. I don't seem to do that anymore. Um, in Africa, it was a little different, you know, where you had rhinos and hippopotamus and elephants and you're in tall grass and you're following a lion, then yeah, there were real animal risks, poisonous snakes, things like that. But uh, again, you know, mountain lions, I, I've never really felt in danger with them. Um, certainly I've a few have made me feel a little bit nervous when you corner them and they decide not to run and they kind of turn and growl at you. But they've never, you know, I've never been um, really threatened by mountain lions. I've only had one walk towards me aggressively on one occasion. She had tiny cubs she was trying to protect. We came upon each other very unexpectedly. I fell out of a tree on a mountain lion once that was awake and um, you know the lion just tried to get away from me. I have crawled into caves with them. I crawled into bushes with them. I've crawled under houses with them. Um, you know none of these cats were you know in any way incapacitated. I just uh, the mindset of a mountain lion is they just want to get away. They just want to get away from you. So I never feel like that part of my work you know people worry that that's the big danger and that's not the big danger for me. It's spraining an ankle or breaking a leg or literally dying. I once in, in Chile was on the back of a horse and I was on a trail on a cliff face and the trail gave out and the horse was holding on by two feet and I'm on the horse. And if we had fallen backwards and I had a horse land on top of me, a hundred foot below me, I'd, I'd be dead. <laughs> and uh, we somehow, me and the horse survived. Those are dangerous moments. Um, the mountain lions are not. What do you do when you see a mountain lion? Is your other question. You know, this is not tongue in cheek. I really do feel this is consider yourself lucky. If you see a mountain lion and you see a mountain lion, it moves through, don't panic, don't worry. Um, it's just a mountain lion. They're, they're part of life. And if this animal approaches you, if you are beginning to feel uncomfortable, uh, meaning that it's, it sees you, it knows you're there, it's now showing curiosity or worse aggression, what should you do? Um, the thing to do with mountain lions first is to do anything you can to make it know that you are a human being. Because generally the second it realizes you're a human being, it's gone. Um, if it still is <laughs> curious about you, so yell, wave your hands. I clap my hands loud when I get worried. I go <laughs> loud as I can. Um, and I just yell, hey, what are you doing? You know, you, do you know what I am? And uh, that's usually enough. With almost all the big cats, if you take two steps towards them, they'll just go, whoa. And that usually stops any kind of negative interaction. Um, and uh, uh, you can also throw things, throw anything you have, your water bottle, your rock, you know, your neighbor, your cat, whatever you got in your hands, throw it at the mountain lion. And just try to let it, you know, break the lock because mountain lions and other big cats, they, when they get curious about something, they, they kind of lock in. And so you will need to break that concentration any way you can. And if, you know, there's a terrible incident, if you're in, for instance, a group and a, a person gets attacked by a mountain lion, you just beat that mountain lion with sticks, whatever you can, 
until it breaks that concentration and then it will run off, but you have to break that concentration. So it's, you know, I don't want to belittle the risks there. You know, mountain lions do attack people um, very, very rarely, of course, but that it is possible. And if you're smart, if you see one and you do the right things and you become aggressive, you become loud, you take the upper hand, the, the chances that anything bad will happen is almost zero. All right, good advice. Uh, um, this is week's class, we'll give you the final question. I can see a lot of wave in, so we should visit and we'll let you guys know. <laughs> Hunter is going to be asking a question. This is Hunter. So how many big cats actually work in groups like well together? To hunt and stuff. The two, so out of the current 40 recognized wild cat species, only two are listed as cooperative. African lions, most people know about, they live in prides, they hunt together, they protect their young together, they have babysitters while their mothers go out and hunt and things like that. And the other is cheetahs, which sometimes these males form coalitions where they will hunt together, they'll defend a territory together, and they'll actually share females in mating opportunities as well. So those are the only ones that are considered cooperative. Um, other species like mountain lions are social, meaning that they hang out with other mountain lions occasionally, they share food once in a while. Um, I think many cat species are like that. They meet their neighbors, they you know have an interaction that isn't a fight, um, that's different. But there's never been a case of two mountain lions or two bobcats or two lynx or two leopards hunting together. And it may, like with that video that I showed, you know, where you see the kittens and they're chasing mom, it looks like they're together, right? But it's not strategic. It's not like mom said, okay, buddy, you go wait next to that bush. I'm going to drive the Wanaka over there and then you leap on the back. Lions actually do that. But mountain lions do not. African lions do, mountain lions do not. And until mountain lions sort of cooperatively forage, hunt together, um, they're going to be considered solitary predators. All right. Well, I want to start off by a big thank you to the YouTube community. Thanks for tuning in today and sending us in some questions. Thank you to our camera classrooms. You guys were awesome as usual. Great questions. Uh, and then Mark, a huge thank you to you. Thanks, first of all, for the conservation work you're doing but also the education work and spending some time uh, hanging out with classrooms today. Well, it was my pleasure. I hope we keep in touch in some way. All right. So boys and girls, I'm going to turn the mic on. If you guys want to do a goodbye and thank you, then we'll sign off. Bye. From our classroom. Bye. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Happy birthday, Fisher. There we go. Happy birthday, Fisher. Uh, thanks everybody for hanging out today. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Oh,